They call it trypophobia. The fear of clustered holes. My psychiatrist says I'll get over it. I know I won't, though. Let me start over. It all started a year ago when my car broke down. And don't laugh when I say this. The car is ancient beyond belief. The gremlin had been my father's and had already served one tour of duty by the time I inherited it. The gas mileage was a joke and the door stuck. The only air conditioning had breathed its last a million summers ago, and the only relief I got during the blistering summers was driving down the road at 60 with the windows down. But it was a freaking Mercedes-Benz compared to taking the train. So, I maintained that son of a bitch for as long as humanly possible, trying to coax my senior citizen car to last until I at least finished college. I blew a gasket or two a couple weeks before the fall semester graduation. Go figure. And it left me only two options. One, I could take the buses all the way across town, camping out in the cold with a dozen other grumpy passengers and a few people I was pretty sure were homeless. Or, I could take the train and camp out in a subway with a few other people I'm pretty sure were homeless. And since one of the options kept me out of the cold, I went with the latter. Now, I first saw him standing a little way down the platform from me. He was just a little guy, a lot shorter than my six foot three. He had the scrawny, runty look of someone who was picked on in high school and now aspired to blend into the tile grout. Since I was such a sociable guy, I meandered over to him to talk to him. Hey, where are you heading? He didn't answer me. He ducked his head lower, refusing to meet my eyes. He reached up, pulling the cords on his blue hoodie tight until nothing but his nose and his upper lip were visible. The gesture very clearly said, fuck off. I wish I heeded the warning. I'm Brian, I said undeterred. I offered him a hand. He only stared at it. I kept it aloft for as long as I could without feeling awkward before I let it go limp and swing at my side. I studied him. He looked about my age, maybe a little younger. Maybe we could sit together. He had to talk to me sometime, I mean, didn't he? I'm heading to the UFC, I told him, not sure why I was bothering someone who clearly didn't want company, but I couldn't let it go. I just wanted him to acknowledge I'd tried. A grunt or a nod would have sufficed, but he didn't react to a damn thing I said. So where does, um, where does your commute take you? I asked. Nothing but silence. I left the encounter feeling disconcerted and a little discouraged, and I consoled myself with the fact that I'd likely never see him again. But I did. The boy in the blue hoodie took the same route I did every single day, and no matter what time I got out of class, he was waiting on the train car with me. I never saw him get off either. When I disembarked to go home to my crappy apartment, he was still in the train car. I had one of the thoughts that you sometimes get late at night. Every horrible thing seems possible, and then the sun has sunk below the horizon and darkness has us jumping at every shadow. Night is where the monsters live and the impossible happens. I began to wonder, if Blue Hoodie Kid was stalking me. I mean, listen, that made no sense, right? So I asked my roommate. He was a guy, for one, and I wasn't much to look at even if Blue Hoodie Kid were so inclined. I was clearly broke, so he wasn't following me for my money. He was a little guy. I didn't think he could jump me. I had at least 50 pounds on him. Maybe it's coincidence, my roommate told me, but I didn't think so. So when I sat down across from Blue Hoodie Kid again, I asked him, 
He wouldn't speak to me, but I could feel his eyes on my face. Are you a little slow? I asked him, uncharacteristically blunt. Can't you talk? Excitement zinged through me when the slur escaped my mouth. I'd always expect to feel shame when I use language like that, but it was freeing to say it. Blue Hoodie Kid didn't say anything, but I saw his spine stiffen. Oh, so you do hear me, I said, an edge to my voice. All the anxiety this kid had caused me was coalescing into a ball of hate. I wanted to lob it at him. If I hurt him enough, maybe he'd choose another train car and leave me the hell alone. He always stood on the train, rather than sit. He clutched the handle like it was a lifeline, knuckles going so white sometimes I thought his fingers would fall off. I stood, getting into his space. Listen, talk to me, fucker, or you're gonna pay for it. And Blue Hoodie Kid shook his head ever so slightly. What? Are you too stupid to talk? I shoved him, and it felt pretty good. He stumbled and fell sideways, hitting the bench on the opposite side of the car with an audible thump. An insane urge to knock his head against the seat seized me. Blue Hoodie Kid didn't even cry out. That annoyed me even further. It was the middle of the night, and all the other passengers in our little car had already disembarked. It was just me and him. If the train hadn't stopped, I'm not sure if I would have acted on that impulse. In fact, I actually shuddered to think how much worse things could have turned out if I did. The train shuddered to a halt and I grabbed my backpack, mumbling curses as I stepped out. Damn my stupid car for breaking down before graduation. Damn college for costing so goddamn much. And damn that kid. Decent human beings talked to each other. Even if it was just to tell each other to leave them the hell alone. Every day after my night class, I'd step foot on the train, and he'd be there, even after I switched cars in an effort to avoid him. And the weight of antagonistic silence just drove me absolutely batshit insane. And sometimes I'd glare back at him. Sometimes I'd fill the silence with talk, and none of it pleasant. The small portion of his face that was visible had lumps on it. I hadn't seen acne that bad since high school, and I myself had my share of monster zits and knew exactly how self-conscious they could make a person. Hey, you need to see a dermatologist, stat, pizza face, I sneered at him one evening. For whatever reason, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. The boy shuffled toward the exit and stood by it until the train began to slow. I watched him exit. I wasn't even sure if this was his stop. He never exited early before. I scooped up my bag and followed him, unable to stop myself. It was stupid enough to go wandering the streets of Chicago after dark, stupider still to do it in this area. I suddenly didn't feel like such a big shot when there are people here who literally kill me as soon as they looked at me. Blue Hoodie Kid had a good lead, but I'd run track in high school, and he didn't look like he'd done a day of exercise in his life. So I settled into an easy jog and I followed him. He kept up the shuffle for three miles until he came to a stop in front of one of the shabbiest houses I'd ever seen. The walls were gray and peeling, the roof sagged, and the sidewalk leading up to the open front door was hanging. There was a pile of broken things in the front yard. I couldn't make out what all the garbage was in the dark, 
but most of it looked like shattered picture frames. He waited until I'd gotten close before he spoke. Do you hear them? The sound of his voice was so shocking it froze me in my tracks. I'd been prepared to stroll by, never acknowledging that I'd followed at all. But he was looking right at me, and he'd spoken. He sounded like he gargled with rocks. The voice was raspy and strained, and came out sounding like he was talking around marbles. Hear what? The drone. I thought maybe you could hear it. The only people who ever talk to me can hear it too. Listen, kid. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I was beginning to regret stepping off the train. I could be at home in my bed right now, instead of talking to this lunatic. But I did this to myself. He reached up, loosened the strings of his hoodie, and finally let it fall back, giving me the first good look at his face that I'd ever gotten. I nearly lost most of my recent meal. The lumps on his face weren't zits, not unless the center of a blackhead moved and wriggled under the inflamed skin, unless there was the shape of something living inside them. The rest of him looked like pictures I'd seen of mummies. His cheeks were sunken and his eyes rolled in his skull, shrunken in their sockets. Do you hear them? He asked again, and the sound of his voice raised goosebumps on my arms. Hear what? I repeated, voice rising in panic. Blue hoodie kid sighed. I guess not. But you will. I wish I'd listened to my gut instinct. It was screaming at me to run. And instead, I opened my stupid mouth. What do you mean? The kid stooped down and picked up one of the broken frames. He stroked the face of the man in the picture with another mournful sigh. If I squinted, I could just make out the guy in the photo. He looked a lot like me. He had a mop of curly brown hair, broad shoulders, and a killer grin. But the thing that had a scream building in my throat was the eyes. I knew that color. Blue hoodie kid had the same eyes. Oh my god. What the hell happened to you? He crooked a finger at me, and, like an idiot, I took a step forward. I'll show you. He turned toward the flickering streetlight and opened his mouth. Inside were a million little holes, honeycombed in the flesh of his throat. They glistened wetly in the light, and I could make out more moving things inside of them. I felt bile coming up at the back of my throat, and I opened my mouth to throw up. And just then, one of the things flew out of his mouth and into mine. For a moment, I was frozen in horror. It bounced against my teeth, stinging my tongue angrily. I tried to spit it out. A hysterical, full-on girly scream was building in my chest, and the thing, whatever it was, plunged into the back of my throat, ripping, biting, and tearing an alcove for itself. Blue Hoodie Kid sighed. Ah, that's better. Tears streamed down my face. I wanted to shout at him, but the pain stole my volume. What did you do to me? Lightened my load a little bit. I don't understand. And he grinned. You will in a few days. He was right. By the end of the week, there was a whole colony of them living in the back of my throat, burrowing holes. 
Every so often, something cold and vile tasting will slip down my throat. And I don't know what they're making in there. And I get the feeling I never want to. Nothing I do can get rid of them. I've gargled with pesticides. My tongue has swollen and my teeth suffer, but the damn things don't die. There's only one way to get rid of them, and I'm getting desperate enough to do it. So, if you're ever in Chicago, taking a train at night, keep to yourself. Read a book. Don't talk. And whatever you do, don't antagonize a skinny kid sitting alone with a hoodie pulled over his head. You won't like what happens if you do. I started going to therapy, hoping I could get hypnotists or some instructions on how to meditate. Anything that would help me figure out how to sleep with these damn things buzzing in the back of my throat. Anyway, I can't actually talk to my psychologist. I have to mime what I'm saying or write it down. We've managed the communication barrier somehow. That doesn't mean that I like what he has to say. He says that it's not a real phobia. That it's something that the internet made up and that I need to wean myself off of social media for my mental health. I don't tell him that I haven't been home since it happened. I don't want to pass this on to my roommate, even if he can be a jackass sometimes. Anyway, I'm not going to screw my roommate over. But, my girlfriend and I have had some issues recently. Maybe just one kiss will set things right.